Okay, folks, thanks very much for coming. Um, our talk today um, is Low Complexity Room Acoustics Modelling from Enzo Tassena, who's an Associate Professor um, at the University of Surrey. Um, Enzo is also the Director of the Institute of Sound Recording at the University of Surrey. His research interests are oralisation, room acoustics modelling, in today's talk, um, sound field reproduction, beam forming and binaural modelling. He received a PhD from University College London and he was then a postdoctoral researcher at KU Leuven, Belgium. He's held visiting research positions at a number of universities internationally and is a senior member of the IEEE and a member of the IEEE Audio and Acoustic Signal Processing Technical Committee. He's also one of our external examiners for the courses here at Salford. So over to you, Enzo. Thanks, Jill, for the introduction. Um, um, all right, so thanks everyone for coming. Let's dive in. Uh, I just corrected the title of the slide because uh, uh, as um, uh, Jonathan was uh, explaining, it's not low complexity, you know, it's not specific enough. What I mean here is low competitional complexity. I just made a last minute addition. So this is joint work with a number of people, no time to go through all of them. Uh, but as usual in research, it's not a uh, one person effort. Um, so what's the context? The application I'm thinking about throughout this uh, talk are these essentially. Uh, virtual reality, uh, where you, know, you immerse yourself into an alternative world, you block your vision of the real world. Augmented reality, where you overlay digital imagery onto the real world, uh, and what's in between mixed reality, where you can also interact essentially with, uh, with uh, virtual objects. Um, in addition to that, I'm also thinking about computer gaming applications. So this is the uh, at least the application scenario that I'm thinking about throughout this talk. And this is application entertainment, education, communication. So there's a number of those. So I'll dive right in, right? What, what do I mean with, uh, why do we need room acoustic modeling here? And what do I mean by that? Well, in the case of virtual reality applications or computer gaming, you'd like to simulate the virtual environment, the acoustics of the virtual environment to, to be able to immerse yourself into that. So in that case, the room acoustics is really the room acoustic of the virtual space that you're rendering, be it a computer gaming simulation with a first person shooter or whatever VR environment you're currently immersed in. In the case of AR, AR and MR, you're trying to simulate the acoustics of the real space. So imagine you're wearing AR, uh, um, a headset or whatever, you want to estimate the acoustics of the real space uh, with whatever method you want and then trying to simulate that so that the virtual elements that you're rendering, they sound the same as the real one. Okay, so there needs to be that consistency between the virtual elements and the real elements into the room. So that's uh, the what we mean by room acoustics and what, which one is the rendering, uh, which one are the room acoustics that we want to render in these applications. So there are some, uh, for instance, in the virtual space, some sound sources, and we want to render the room acoustics and make the person feel like they're transported into that space. Why do we need this? Um, there is a, a number of reasons why you want to render room acoustics in these applications. Okay. One of the most important one is, especially if you're wearing headphones, you, uh, you need to add room acoustics in order to properly externalize sound. Multiple studies have shown that you know, without room acoustics rendering, it's essentially whenever you play back stuff over headphones, it's going to be localized inside your head. So it's really important to be able to externalize sound, to make real, to make these uh, virtual sources to sound as if they're outside your head, you do need to render room acoustics. It's important for auditory immersion. We're going to get back to this uh, later in the slides. A sense of realism and presence, spaciousness, envelopment, convincing illusion of sound source distance is quite important. If you studied um, direct to reverberant ratio, right, it's one of the main cues that we use to uh, under, to, to estimate what is the distance of a source, and that implies that you need to render uh, reverberation, of course. Um, apparent source width is also another one. So. You know, in this application, room acoustics modeling is quite important. Uh, this is a problem that is really multidisciplinary, right? It involves, of course, the physics of room acoustics, and you have uh, people working on that a lot here. Uh, it also involves perception of room acoustics, uh, which is, you know, of course, related, but it's another in maybe independent field. It's 
Uh, it's m a lot more messy, unfortunately, right? When you deal with the physics, there is often like elegant uh, uh, frameworks within which you can work. Perception is a lot messier because we don't know exactly how people perceive uh, uh, room acoustics. And then there is the signal processing uh, area, the signal processing aspect to it, where we try maybe to build new signal processing models, either to approximate the physical ones uh, and so on. Uh, so within my group, the Institute of Sound Recording, we're very much at the intersection of perception and signal processing. Uh, my understanding of this group is that maybe you're more, more in the middle. There is a lot of representation in terms of physics, but, uh, but yeah, but all of these are important and relevant. So it's multidisciplinary. It's not an easy problem, and in, it's, it's got several aspects to take into account. Um, so I don't want to dive into the literature about room acoustic modeling, and probably many of you uh, uh, have a background in that. Uh, but just to, you know, just a very broad classification, we have some models that are wave-based models, uh, where by that I mean you take the wave equation and you try to solve it numerically. Uh, and that involves uh, spatial discretization as well as uh, either temporal frequency discretization of the wave equation. And there is a lot of elegant models out there. You know, BAM is one of them, bunch of element method of finite difference time domain, finite volume method, and so on and so forth. Now, within these applications, uh, and we can argue that there, there is a way to actually use this model within applications in AR and VR, but generally speaking, these models are quite computationally complex and difficult to run in real time, especially if you need to take into account different platforms like, like a PlayStation, which is quite powerful, versus uh, AR glasses, which have very, uh, uh, very tight computational constraints. Uh, geometrical acoustic model that make the assumption sound, uh, approximate the assumption that sound travels like rays, um, uh, are a lot more, uh, 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 a lot lighter from the computational perspective, but they still require convolution, right? You obtain an impulse response, and then you need to convolve with whatever anechoic sound you have, which is something you might not uh, want to have, right? We would like even convolution on its own is quite computationally heavy and something that if we can, we would like to avoid that. Uh, the models that are lightest uh, from the computational perspective uh, are what we can call delay network based models. Okay, and this is what this entire talk is going to be about. Um, these are amount to, as the name suggests, network of delay lines. These are recursive network of delay lines. Uh, and they tend to be, as I said, fastest models. They do involve recursion. Um, I was thinking I wanted to add a slide from Jonathan's presentation a while back, also showing that essentially room acoustics is also recursive, right? We, if you think about boundary element method, the same signals get recirculated within the system, right? So it kind of makes sense. It's just that instead of having like a full wave-based model that involves re recirculation like room acoustic, physical room acoustics does, we try to have recursive systems that are a lot more compact, a lot lighter. Okay. Any questions before I uh, move on? I don't want to, like, you know, we can also interact in between. There is no constraint to have all questions at the end. Usually make it quite uncomfortable until somebody. Uh... Okay, let's just move on then. All right, so the first model I would like to talk about is one of the standard models used in the field, which is called feedback delay networks. Feedback delay networks have been proposed a while back. Uh, uh, one of the earliest artificial reverberator was what we call Schroeder reverberator. Uh, it's not on this slide, but then this was, uh, this was extended first in the 80s, then in the 90s. Now, more recently, uh, Sebastian Schlecht and others have uh, taken taken the topic forward. So it's quite a long history and it's quite a simple model. OK, so you have an input, this X of N, which is essentially representing the, uh, I don't know if you can see the mouse, you can see the mouse, uh, the anechoic so sound, and then Y of N is going to represent the reverberated sound. And what you do is you split it up into different uh, parts uh, and uh, across with multipliers, so some delay lines, other multipliers, but then the key aspect is this recur rec recursion here, right? All of these channels, they go into a feedback matrix, a linear operation here, that then it's get added back into the uh, sounds. Is there some uh, somebody from... Uh, okay. 
Okay, somebody complete. Somebody complete. Okay. Is, is it an echo or somebody's complete? Oh, okay. Did I continue or? We've got a feedback delay line. A uh, feedback, yeah, exactly. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, yeah, this this in fact, if, if you if you if you looked into recently into state space model, this is an extension of a state space model where the delay lines instead of being one sample, there are multiple samples. But in any case, this this recursion it makes sure that you get that. Uh, you know, um, essentially exponential increase in number of echoes every time you go through the network, uh, which does uh, fit well within the. matrix, typically a Hadamard matrix for A, then the delays are just mutually prime. So right, nothing that is con directly linked to the actual room, the room that you're trying to simulate. Uh, and if the prototype you start from lossless, that means having all the poles on the unit circle. And then what you do is you move the poles. There are some elegant uh, uh, equations to set those uh, attenuation coefficients um, in such a way to obtain a certain reverberation time, OK? So the approach is, I want a certain reverberation time. I design the network to have that reverberation time. That's pretty much it. Okay. Um, there has been some work to extend that. Uh, for instance, what is it that you do if you want to model double slope decay in a room, for instance, to, to model uh, two connected spaces, for instance? Uh, so, so some work has been done in that direction. Uh, I've done some work on that with the Ochi Samadas and Sebastian Schlecht. Uh, we published that this year. Uh, and you know, it's, with, with most of the things that I'm going to present today, I'm just going to give you the main ideas. OK, I'm not going to give you the maths because I don't want to put you all to sleep. Uh, but if you're interested in it, all the, uh, the, uh, the uh, references are at the bottom of the slide. You can take a picture and take a look for yourself. OK, a lot of this stuff is very math heavy and I can very easily put you to sleep. So I just really want to give you the main ideas. Uh, so, so what can be done here is, for instance, to, 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 to split up the matrix into a block matrix, each representing the recirculation within one room, and those are the block diagonal elements, uh, and the off-diagonal elements, they represent the recirculation between the rooms. Uh, and then you can split up also the delay lines and the absorption coefficients. And then there are clever ways to set uh, all of these elements to set some some specific values, like for instance, how much energy is traveling from one uh, room to another, or what is the reverberation time that we want to obtain, and so on and so forth. All details you can find in the in the paper. The latest iteration we worked on was to notice that uh, when you do deal with connected spaces, you're going through an aperture, and that is likely going to have like a frequency dependent uh, effect on the on the response that you get. So instead of having uh, therefore, that means that that matrix is not just a, a matrix of scalar values, but you need to have filters inside that matrix. Uh, and then that becomes what we call instead, and in order to, co to, to maintain losslessness, right, which is what I said at the beginning that you start with, this goes from having a unitary matrix or orthogonal matrix to what we call a para-unitary matrix. So a, essentially a MIMO system that conserves energy. So we've done some work on that and it's all on the, uh, in the paper, but now we can, Using FDNs, we can model connected spaces, also including frequency dependent coupling between the different rooms. Okay. Um, so that's all I wanted to say about feedback delay networks. The other topic that has been one of my main topics in, in my, uh, perhaps unwittingly just happened during my PhD and then I started working on this, is something that we call scattering delay networks. This is another recursive system Right, that feeds uh, sound into itself and tries to have some perceptual uh, 
uh, effect uh, uh, on like you know modeling perceptually uh, a certain room. So this is what the model looks like. You should interpret this plot as a top down view of a room where you have a certain source and a certain observation point. And each of these lines, except for the square, of course, which represents the room, uh, represent a delay line. More specifically, a delay line that has a delay length that corresponds to how long it takes for sound to travel from one position to another within the room. OK, so we have a, a set of delay lines that go from the source to these positions, which we call scattering nodes, scattering junctions. So these dash dot lines here. OK, then we have some dash lines that go from these nodes to the microphone position, the observation position. You have this other dotted line that is the direct component. And then we have bidirectional delay lines that connect all of the junctions, all of the nodes. OK, so this is how this network is set up. OK, so quite a few delay lines, that's it. And then there is at the scattering junction, there is a matrix operation. I'm not going to go into the detail of that, but just, you know, the um, essentially you wait all of the incoming delay lines, uh, you put them in a vector, you multiply that by matrix and obtain the outgoing delay lines. But I don't want to, again, detail that is in the paper. Uh, so just to give you an idea of how these things work, uh, this is a, uh, uh, a video showing imagine that you have a sound source then you play back an impulse this impulse is fed into all of these delay lines and you have these impulses they travel at the sound of uh, at the speed of sound within these delay lines okay uh, then what uh, what happens is that when when they hit one of hit one of the nodes for instance let's look at the stop one here then that impulse gets replicated and goes into all other delay lines directions that includes going to the other walls, as well as going this red dot here, uh, going towards the microphone position. OK, and then this operation continues, which gives rise to an exponentially increasing number of echoes, which you can say it's perhaps a positive property. OK. Now. Uh, this is not the way we would actually run it. We don't calculate an impulse response because, as I said, we uh, we don't want to do convolution, uh, right? So the advantage of this is that you really can use it as an IIR filter. You essentially fit in not an impulse and obtain impulse response. You really fit in the uh, signal itself, right? Uh, and then the output is going to be uh, this, uh, whatever you, you pick up from the microphone point. Okay. Are there questions about this? Yeah. So with the previous example you gave, you seem to use restrictive like a mono or stereo acoustic. Yeah. Right? yeah. Do you actually preserve the spatial information yeah. here so we can yeah. sort of render it out the same as I have a slide on ah, that in a second. Sorry. Yeah, it's always good when I have somebody question and then I have a slide about that later. But yeah. Okay. Just don't want to I'd give advanced information, otherwise I say the same stuff twice, but yeah. OK, cool. So uh, something I didn't tell you is where are these nodes positioned? Well, we don't position them just anywhere. We position them exactly when first order reflection happens uh, in such a way that one of those impulses travel exactly the same time as an, a first order reflection. OK, so that ensures that uh, you have first order reflection that are exact okay, from the timing perspective. A bunch of other stuff I'm not telling you about is how do you do attenuation? There is also a way to ensure that first order reflection are correct in terms of attenuation. And I point out that they're also here, they're also correct in terms of direction. So you know where the sound is coming from. Can, you can weight it by an HRTF filter or whatever, but in any case, the, that direction is exact for first order reflections. Okay. Second order reflection, they're not exact. So you can imagine, for instance, a blue line on the right plot here. Uh, that that's the exact specular second order reflection. Uh, there is not such a path within the network, but the yellow path is an approximation of it. Okay, and so what happens is that the second order reflection is there, but it's approximated. The higher order reflections they get more and more approximated even more. Okay, so from this point of view, you can interpret it as an approximation of an image method or specular reflection method or ray tracing without specular reflections and so on but within a recursive framework. So you don't need to run convolutions. It's a lot less. Okay. Um, 
So, and so let me point out also that from the perceptual perspective, uh, this seems to be quite appropriate because it's known perceptually that early reflections are more important. Uh, whenever you get to higher order reflections, then the structure becomes quite chaotic, statistically speaking. So from the perceptual point of view, it doesn't matter that much. Anymore. So you're accurately reconstructing what is important perceptually and then approximating what is less important perceptually. So the alternative interpretation you can give is uh, this model called scattering linear network is a he inherits some properties from another class of models, which is called digital waveguide networks, which was proposed by Julius Smith uh, at Karma in the 80s. And that property also involves that if you choose that matrix operation I mentioned before appropriately, you can see this network of delay lines as a physical model of something else. And that something is that freaky, uh, if you let me, uh, network of acoustic tubes. So if you really do the math, you can prove that that model is actually an approximation of this physical model. Okay? I didn't build that. Somebody asked me in some uh, uh, presentations. This is a rendering on AutoCAD or something like that. Okay. So what does it mean? Uh, what does the, this thing represent? So the uh, the black, uh, the two spheres represent observation point and uh, and source. Uh, and the blue spheres represent scattering nodes. Uh, and each of these tubes represent a delay line. So if you imagine that you put a, a clap, uh, clapping sound into one of these spheres and then you stick your head where another sphere is, then what you would hear at the other end of this network of acoustic tube is very similar or in good approximation identical to the output of this model, of this network of delay lines. Okay. Now, Turns out that this network of delay lines, this network of acoustic tubes and the real room, they share a number of features. They share, for instance, if you do the attenuation appropriately, which we do by modeling absorption, just using frequency dependent losses at the nodes, right? You take Vorlander's book or somebody else's that models the absorption coefficient as a function of frequency, and then you filter each of these delay lines at the output with that filter, and that's it. If you do that, then this network of acoustic tube and the real room, they share, for instance, reverberation time. It turns out essentially that the mean free path, the average time that, that takes a reflection to travel from one point, from one wall to another, is similar in that network of acoustic tubes as it is in the real room. And putting together the fact that they have similar mean free path and similar abs abs uh, absorption means that you get similar reverberation time at the end. So in this plot, for instance, you have absorption coefficient on the x-axis and T60 on the y-axis. And we compare it to the image method and sub engineering formula. And what you get with this model is in black and it's quite in between them. It's almost identical to what you get from the image model, which is not obvious, right? This is a recursive system and you get almost exactly the same reverberation time as the image metal model. Okay. Something else that is similar is what we call normalized codensity. This is a measure that was introduced by Jonathan Abel and Patti Wang, again at Karma, uh, that, that tells that it's an objective measure of a subjective feature, which is a reverberation texture, so-called. So, -called. so uh, we would hope that the texture, or in this case, the uh, the the buildup of texture, if you will, is similar with with the baseline model that we use in this case. So on the x-axis here, you have time. On the y-axis, you have this measure of normalized echo density. Uh, it's a measure that goes from zero to one, zero being no echo density whatsoever, just impulsive sound, to one, which is white noise-like uh, uh, response. And you know, so so we use it as a measure, as I said, of texture or buildup or texture, and it does turn out to be quite close to what we use as a baseline, which is the image model. And we can argue all day if that's a correct baseline or not, but at least in terms of comparing it with the image model, it was quite okay. simple. Okay, the computational complexity is uh, quite low of course, because it's a recursive model. Uh, so in this case, we, I compared it, we compared it to just FFD-based overlap add convolution, which also arguably maybe it's not, you know, there are faster models than this, uh, but it is one to two orders of magnitude faster uh, than convolution alone, right? Not even including uh, calculating an impulse response. And then comes from the fact that you have uh, uh, recursion in there. 
Okay. Another advantage is, so you see the philosophy of a feedback delay network, we started by saying, you, in that case, it was you want a certain T60 and then you obtain the parameters. The opposite is true here. So this quite different philosophies, right? You set the absorption, the room dimension, the position of source and microphone, and then the T60 or the acoustical parameters, they come naturally from that. Some people may not prefer it. Some sound designer actually prefer to control the T60, but this is the philosophy that is used here. Okay. Okay, questions? Trevor, yeah. Yeah. Think of it in your source model, you can get strange effects where you get repetitious paths. Yeah. Yeah. Which can lead to strange audio effects. Absolutely. Yeah. So you've got fewer different paths in your model than the image source model. Yeah. 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 So do you get coloration effects because you've got these repetitious small numbers of paths? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that's a very good question. The uh, if you choose, if you're in some degenerate cases, like imagine you have the source and the observation point in the same position, that means that most of the delay line they're going to have a similar length. And if you remember from feedback networks, right, it's that leads to some, yeah, audible artifact. I'm not entirely sure in terms of comp filtering, but definitely in terms of perceivable of a completely wrong echo buildup, that does happen. Uh, but I would say, generally speaking, it's quite the generic cases. So, you know, as soon as you move even a little, uh, then these delay lines are going to be all maybe not prime of each other, but they're going to be different enough that it's harder for these things to happen. So, yeah, the answer is I don't know exactly in terms of coloration, but it it it's usually quite lush. It's unless, as I said, you 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 observe in very specific positions. Yeah. 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 So I'm gonna get back to that in a second. We haven't extended SDN per se to multiple uh, to to non-rectangular rooms. Although you can imagine that, you know, it, it just amount, I, we think it may just amount to position in source uh, nodes at position of first order reflection, but it becomes trickier when you have not, you don't have visibility and so on. And we actually haven't tested then if then the, those properties of having correct T60 remain. So within the context of SDNs, we haven't moved for, for forward. We actually just got a big grant uh, from EPSRC and one of the postdocs is going to look into that. Uh, but yeah, there is another model I'm going to talk I tell you about later that does naturally take into account no rectangular rooms. But yeah. Yeah. I was going to ask you that mind about um, material. So you, you said that uh, at the boundary there's a filtering process yeah. for absorption. I was just wondering how you account for differing absorption over a wall. Yeah. I mean, it, it, the thing you put in that head is your picture with the tubes. Yeah. Like something that looks like a window or a portal. Yeah. 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 And yeah. if your first order reflection point sits yeah. on the wall. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we haven't tried. Okay. You're welcome to, you know, okay. give it to a, uh, maybe to a student to do as a tech project. But, uh, but yeah, uh, so we, we've been thinking about this and, uh, you, you know, it could be, so one thing could be to average out the absorption coefficient. But by the way, this is not just for SDN. This could be useful sure. for other applications, right? The image method, for instance, will become easier if you can average out an entire wall, right? Uh, so, uh, yeah, another option, and I'm not entirely sure what's important. It may may have to do with how the, you know, with how the diffuse field behaves. But you know, some other option that we thought about is what if you project a, uh, let's say, a chair onto the wall, onto the uh, onto the floor, uh, in terms of absorption characteristic. Is that more accurate than just averaging out from a top-down perspective? You know, these sort of things. It's but it's not obvious, and I'm not entirely sure if. Uh, if it's been answered as a question, I think it's it's actually quite useful, as I said, within a number of models, but we don't know. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So I thought of having a little test. So whenever you have different models, as probably some of you know, they do sound different, right? A BAM model is likely to sound slightly different from, uh, well, for the sure, quite different from an image method model, but it may sound different from other models as well. Right. So even though they're trying to solve the way the same uh, problem, they use different approaches and inevitably they sound different. But the question is, do they sound plausible or not? Right. Because that's the objective within these applications. Okay. 
So what I'm going to do, and I hope I'm not going to click on the slide because then on the next slide uh, the the answer is going to appear. But I'm going to I'm going to play back three different models. One is this network of acoustic tubes. Another one is the image model. The other one is find a difference time domain. They're all quite harsh because we're using frequency independent absorption, just because it was easier to uh, for us to run the FDTD simulations. Okay, and then I would like you to think: is the which one is the network of acoustic tubes? Okay, and see if you can recognize it. I think there is quite an expert listener in the room, so I'm quite scared at this time. I've given this a few times, but anyways. So I'll play back first the anechoic one. Uh, of course, uh, is there a way to increase the volume? Okay, well. Try that okay. again. Yeah. But that'll either work or not work. Oh, oh that's, that's nothing. Entirely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Was it? It's come out the projector at the back, I think, isn't it? But it. Um, I mean, it's good enough. We can just. Um, let's just increase the just volume. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's try. So this is the anechoic one. Uh, of course, you're listening to it through this room's uh, reverberation, so you have to adjust for that, of course, uh, unless you're at home wearing headphones. But I'll play back the anechoic sample again. And one more time. It's going to be quite tricky. All right, so I'll start with the first one. Second. And third. Okay. Do you want me to play them again or is it? Yeah. Okay. I'll start with the first. Right, so how many people think it was the first one? Yeah, which one is the acoustic, uh, the network of tubes? Yeah. Okay, you think number three? Okay, let's say number one, nobody. Number two, okay, number three. Okay, let's see, I honestly don't know, uh, but it was uh, around half, half. Uh, number two and number three. So let's. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Yes. All right. So OK, so about half of you got it right. I'll say that that's good enough for me. OK, um, OK, so again, the, the question is, it is plausible or not, right? I mean, it's not it's, the fact that you can't that um, not a majority of you can recognize it. Uh, it's a good thing, but anyways, uh, is it plausible or not? And, uh, you know, we've run some experiments, I'll show the, the results in a second. No, 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 okay, sorry. So getting back to your question, um, because you have a physical interpretation of the network, right, you also know where these delay lines are coming from, uh, and that means that you can weight each of the delay line by whatever filter you want. That can be a higher order ambisonics, um, uh, equivalent can be an HRTF, it can be uh, whatever microphone array you, you'd like to use. And the same goes for the uh, directional sound source. Another uh, possibility is that you, uh, you know, you can also change the simulation as you go along, right? If the virtual listener moves, you just update the delay line length, and that enables uh, six stuff uh, rendering. Uh, so we've run some perceptual evaluations, both in my group and others, uh, and you know it, it sounds essentially similar to a feedback delay network. Uh, and but you know, uh, and it, in some cases it was actually so, okay. On the left hand side, we have uh, a test where we ask people to rate naturalness. This was a static and monaural case, um, and uh, yeah. So SDN is on the right hand side. So it had like a slightly larger naturalness than all the other models, even though it was the cheapest 
uh, one, uh, or maybe FDN, I can't remember now which order of FDN we use. So, but they're probably comparable and still it sounded uh, uh, more natural. Uh, it's a, uh, it's the anchor. So this is a modified mushroom that we use. It's a high pass filter. Um, so yeah, then we had a, a binaural room impulse response, which was roughly the same as SDN, which was quite surprising. And then we use uh, CAT and the simplified, geometrically simplified version of CAT. Um, so uh, somebody else in uh, Michele Gerazzo and Stefania Serafin uh, have done some work on this as well independently, and they've shown that uh, this sense of externalization that results from using room acoustics is actually improved uh, quite significantly uh, when you do use uh, the, a model like this. So you go for uh, the anechoic case. Let's take a look, for instance, at this one. So okay, where is the externalization? This one here, this plot in the middle. So if you use SDN, you go from anechoic and externalization on a ray on a scale from zero to one is here, so quite low. Then when you do introduce reverberation, it increases quite a bit. Okay, I have no reason to believe that an FDN would have a similar effect, by the way. It's just that it's important for reverberation to be there. Um, it even did more than a higher order ambisonics measurement, which was, at least for me, it was quite surprising, but it is what it is, I guess. Uh, another experiment we've run is uh, in virtual reality. Uh, so what we've done is asking people to wear a VR headset. Uh, they were presented with a certain scene with a sound source represented as a sphere. And then what we did is to change the spatial audio rendering method, going from head track binaural plus SDN, uh, removing SDN here, and then just monaural. So no update with respect to moving your head. Uh, what we also did is to change the video resolution. Okay, the video resolution from 100% pixel variety to 60% to 20% of the maximum video resolution that this uh, head mounted display could accommodate. And then what we asked people is we changed this three combination, three by three, this nine combination of things. And we asked people, how, how immersed do you feel? And there are certain definitions of immersion. I can't remember which exactly we use in this case, uh, but yeah, the, the feeling of being engrossed into the experience or something along those lines. I can't remember exactly. And what we found was quite striking. Uh, and it's just the two main points I'd like you to compare is these two. This red dot here represents having reverb and uh, head tracking, but at 20% video resolution. And this blue points representing having no reverb, but 100% video resolution. And they had the similar level of immersion, right? This is quite striking. It means essentially that if adding reverb has a similar effect to increasing video resolution five times on immersion, which is quite striking. Once again, also in this case, I have no reason to believe that an FDN wouldn't achieve something similar, right? In my mind, at least we haven't tested it, but in my mind, it's about having reverb into the simulation. Okay. Of course, adding a reverberator like this is a lot cheaper than in computationally speaking, than increasing video resolution five times. We haven't done the math, but you know, it's gonna be order of magnitude more expensive. And it's also an argument that I tell companies to put forward, like a lot of people invest money into image and video. We we're talking with David about this before. And you know, uh, it's, they shouldn't, right? Audio is important, okay? Um, so we've also extended, we, I mean, there, it's a student from uh, Hussein's group uh, at METU extended this model to multiple volumes, uh, couple volumes, and it wasn't as simple as having two SDNs, unfortunately. Uh, I'm not going to go into the detail of that, but essentially you need five SDNs to get the energy decay right, the energy decay behavior right. So you need to have like a straight SDN for the room that you're physically in, I can't remember which one it is. I think this one, right? So for to model this room that you're physically in, uh, another one that goes from the room you're physically in to the aperture, that is, I think, this one. Another one that accounts from the uh, from uh, accounts for the reverberation within the room for going from this position to itself, uh, and and another one I can't, can't even remember uh, that I think ah it's reverberating that part back into the aperture as well, into the first room, in the room you're physically in, and then the one that models the path from the aperture to the microphone position, which is this one here. Okay, so more complicated than we initially thought, 
Uh, you can take a look at the details into the paper. I'm not fully convinced that one can do something simpler than this. I, I hope it's possible, but we, all, we really did try quite a few combinations to try to get the energy decay curve right. By right, I mean that we compare it to measurements in uh, uh, scale models. Uh, some other work that we try to do is, OK, what if we want higher order reflections to be correct? What do we do then? And we use two approaches here. The first is uh, adding nodes into second order or higher order positions. Uh, and also in that case, there are a few details. Uh, this is a paper at DAFEX by Matteo, um, one of my PhD students. Uh, and, you know, there are some uh, details you need to take care of when you do use this approach, because then the number of delay lines increases quite a bit and maybe the echo density increases too much. So there are things that you need to take care of. But if you do, do the uh, design right, uh, what we've done in this experiment is using a mushra, but this time with the reference, uh, which is catacoustics. Uh, and we saw that indeed you did get closer to catacoustic with the higher order versions, uh, I think in terms of naturalness. So we asked them comparing to the reference, how does the naturalness of the model compares? Uh, and this uh, different different methods, but one of these higher order versions did have a significantly statistically significantly larger uh, or higher naturalness score than the standard SDN, which is here. Now the problem with this approach is that as you add nodes, then essentially the the size of that feedback matrix increases quite a bit. Okay, uh, I can't remember if it's quadratically or more. But the computational complexity increases quite a bit, even if you just double the number of nodes. So an alternative approach we've been thinking about is what if we, okay, is there a way to still obtain uh, accurate early reflections, but without increasing the computational complexity? Uh, and we published a paper last month at WASPA on this. Um, and just going to give you the main idea, but essentially it's to use approaches that are used similar, similarly in other fields, where you essentially model the early reflection as a separate module, Right, there's a separate delay line with its own specialization and so on and so forth. And then what you do is that you only feed the network uh, still with only one node per wall, uh, but you feed the network with what we call the last bounds of a whatever order you chose of reflection. So for instance, this is a second order version of this model and you have that red line. I don't know if people can see from home. So this red line here represents a first order reflection that is modeled separately as a separate module. Uh, and then this second order reflection, this is the true one. What we do is we model it by taking the signal that you have at the end of it, right? The last bounce of it, and then feeding it into the scattering node here. Okay. Now, of course, because you have multiple second order reflection that have the last bounce on one wall, you need to take care of a few things, right? How do you then position the scattering node? And we try different approaches. And in, in, in the end, using the centroid of the last bounce for that wall, it seemed to work out OK. okay. Also, in this case, some peculiarities about then how do you handle attenuation and so on, but all details that you can find in the paper. And on the right hand side, uh, the uh, energy decay curve, they're very similar in this case, because essentially that depends on the recirculation within the model. So it's not really affected by exactly how you feed the network or not significantly. Um, and but so we looked into the normalized echo density again. So on the x-axis you have time, on the y-axis you have that measure of texture, as I said before. And we we compared it again to the ISM. Not sure if this is the correct baseline, but at least you know because we wanted accurate specular reflection, it seems like a reasonable choice. Uh, and indeed, what we saw is that by using a higher order version along these lines obtains a more similar match. Uh, of the normalized echo density with the blue curve, which is the baseline that we use in this case. So this curve here is this one here. It's the centroid version of this uh, second order. I can't remember which order. Ah, yeah, third order uh, model. And you can see that it follows quite closely the image model build up up until the point it gets to one, which is the most important uh, transition point, so to speak. Now, one thing that was not obvious is that, you know, of course, we're increasing the number of early reflections correct. So you may think, OK, this is obvious because you're getting further uh, into that uh, time axis. But in fact, it was it's not that way, right? The the early reflection that we're exactly matching, they arrive until around 0.25 milliseconds. 
sorry, 25 milliseconds or 30 milliseconds, so right around here, more or less. So only around here, we have an exact control of the uh, of the uh, uh, normalized condensate and the reflections. But it turns out that even after, if you feed the network in this specific way, then it turns out that this leads still to continue to resonate within the network uh, with a with a more or less correct buildup. And by correct, again, I mean um, uh, match with the image model. OK, so other people have worked on this stuff. It's uh, not just uh, us that we like this topic. Uh, group at York and Alto worked on uh, extending STNs to outdoor spaces and scattering from trees. Uh, Queen Mary is implemented as part of an AR system. Uh, the Sonicom uh, EU uh, project that deals with uh, audio for AR and VR at the moment is one of the largest uh, network uh, at the moment running, implemented as part of their toolkit. And I just also just heard that this is a paper that the first version is a conference paper that was published a while back. Uh, and and the uh, vice president of audio of North Star, uh, Rockstar North uh, told me that the room acoustic model in GTA 5 was heavily inspired by this, uh, which is quite something, right? It's one of the most, I think, 170 million copies sold. Uh, so that, that made my day, uh, most definitely, yeah. Uh, uh so yeah uh so yeah that's it uh for this part i'm just going to move on quickly to this other acoustic render networks and then we can conclude but before we do are there questions yeah so i'm just going to comment that the um the thing with the, the the portal is kind of like you would expect it to be if you started from the premise of like a couple of boundary element systems not basically what you'd expect it to be it is that that's exactly what it is. So with my EPSRC NIA uh, project is essentially based on that idea. That is quite similar to a boundary element method. That's right. I think what's most similar to is, is surface-based geometrical acoustics. Right. Which is to that, which is part of that for ray tracing. Uh, yeah, that's what the uh, last section is. Yeah, it's fantastic. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. So this is exactly what I'm going to talk about, like acoustic radius transfer. Yeah. So. Uh, so uh, probably some of you are already familiar with it, but and I'm not going to go into the detail of it. There is a fantastic paper by Lauri Savioy and someone else, I can't remember their name, on what the, we could call the room acoustic rendering equation, which puts within a single framework a lot of the geometrical acoustic models, ray tracing, acoustic radio transfer, and so on and so forth. But roughly speaking, very roughly speaking, we're talking about a method that in, takes into account how energy is propagating within a room or radiance is propagating within a room. So you start from a certain source and this propagates towards the boundaries and then each boundary is discretized in some patches. It's up to you how you choose the size of the patches or the shape of the patches and so on and so forth. And essentially then it follows how energy then is propagated within the network uh, with sorry within the room in terms of energy exchange between different patches in the room okay so this is like really uh, it's um, very basic uh, uh, um, uh, overview of what the acoustic rendering transfer uh, acoustic radiance transfer uh, uh, looks like um, so there has been some previous work done by uh, by and others uh, on how then to approximate this model using an FDN-like form. Okay, say so FDN-like because you have some, you don't just have multipliers here, you also have some filters and some delays in here, and you do also in the recursive path. So it's something that they called acoustic radiance, uh, acoustic rendering networks. Okay, so how do you then model each of these parts? To, so as to, uh, to uh, so as to approximate in some sense acoustic radiant transfer model, and this is always similar ideas, right? It's uh, essentially a recursive model that tries to approximate room acoustics by taking into account its recursive nature by itself. Okay. Um, now Matteo started looking into this, uh, and he saw observed that accuracy was sometimes poor especially for second and high order reflections, if you don't have a high enough uh, 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 spatial resolution. Also, you could not control scattering in the way that the design was made, right? They used, uh, because it was the first topic on, the first work on this topic, they used some very simple uh, way to then model the R tilde uh, matrix, okay? 
Um, and you know, I'm not going to go into details so also because we haven't published this yet. So, um, but but I hope it will soon. I'm hoping this week. That it's, it's partly mostly my fault. It's been sitting on my desk for a couple of months now, and Matteo is hating me for it. Um, but anyways, I'm hoping to to upload it on archive within the next I don't know one or two weeks. Um, but essentially, the idea, the idea is to gen. Uh, he found like you know a very simple way to then in, uh, impose that uh, early reflections are correct essentially by using a separate bypass structure to have early reflections correct and then feeding the network using not first order uh, first order reflection meaning from the source to the boundary but using first order to boundary and then reflect it back which ensures that you essentially don't include first order reflection to the model uh, and he also found a way using uh, some uh, linear algebra models that I'm not going to tell you about on how to model the uh, the reflection and the diffract uh, sorry the scattering from each of the patch more accurately, uh, and and that Im essentially improved quite a bit also the energy decay behavior. Sorry that these plots are quite poor uh, graphically. I've done some as I said before. I've done my slides on LaTeX. Sorry, I was just I know I'm a self farming person. Um, and then converted them to PowerPoint, and it seems like it failed a little here. But anyway, so modeling this space, like a U-shaped space, this is the uh, the room impulse response, and it's supposed to show that the early reflections are better uh, modeled compared to cat acoustics. Uh, and then here, it's the energy, uh, sorry, it's the T6 as a function of frequency, again, compared to cat. Uh, we believe that the simulation is such that cat is not really all that accurate, at least in this point, it might be in this point as well. Uh, but the baseline from Bayes model is up here, which is clearly uh, quite off, whereas uh, Matteo's model actually works a lot better. So, yeah, any questions on this before I go into the outro? Okay, all right, another time maybe. All right, so just outro, not conclusions. Like, you know, I just wanted to tell you that it's important to render room acoustics in these applications. Probably you knew already, but maybe reminded you. Models typically involve recursion, just like physical room acoustics happens. Different models have similar structure, but it's not obvious. You can see that, you know, even though they're similar structure, how to exactly do the modeling, it's not, it's not clear, it's not obvious. There is a number of open question. Perceptually speaking, it's important to have accurate early reflections. And I'm, you know, shooting myself in the foot with all the work we've done in the past year, but we don't know yet. So we want to run some perceptual evaluations to see whether that actually matters. It may matter in terms of coloration, but in terms of plausibility, we don't know. What can we get away with with not modeling in room acoustics? There's been a lot of work done in this, but you know, it's still not an open, it's still not a close and shut question. Uh, also, another question is what if we suffer measure responses, right? What if you have on your AR glasses some uh, measure responses and you want to model that? And how to then fit the parameters of all these models? It's not really obvious. There has been some work also in uh, uh, differentiable uh, artificial reverberations models uh, that goes in that direction. And that's the only time I mentioned deep learning into this talk. I just want to point out. All right, so I just want to have, a, if you don't mind, I'm sorry, Joe. Jonathan, uh, a shameless plug for some things that are happening and might be of interest to you. The first is just, uh, that project that I mentioned earlier to look into SDN for uh, uh, for non-rectangular uh, non rooms. It's part of a larger EPSRC project, which we call SIAT, Challenges in Immersive Audio Technology. This is a project uh, that I'm leading with uh, Zoran Cvetkovic at King's College, uh, Philip Nelson and Christine Evers in Southampton. And overall, we are going to be able to hire, I think we're going to open within the next couple of weeks, uh, six postdocs position for three years. Um, so quite a big project. Two of these positions will be in my group at Surrey. And we're going to look into room acoustic modeling. That workshop is going to be at uh, King's College. In my group, we're going to look more into perceptual evaluation, psychoacoustic modeling, and sound field reproduction. So if you know somebody or you yourself are interested, just uh, well, uh, either email me or uh, keep an eye out on LinkedIn or auditory mailing list or something like that. Um, and you know we're looking to start in March, but I'm thinking it's unlikely. So if, even if it's, I don't know, a PhD student that is ending within the next, I don't know, six, eight months or something like that, that would still work out okay. Uh, the other bit is that uh, we're hosting DAFX at Surrey. Uh, DAFX is the International Conference on Digital Audio Effects. 
Um, don't know if anybody's ever heard of it, but um, yeah, okay, some people have. Uh, so the conference will be at Surrey September 3rd to 7th uh, next year. The paper deadline is, is almost exactly in four months. And because that's my bias, uh, you know, we're encouraging this year um, uh, submissions in uh, spatial audio, uh, model, including room acoustic modeling uh, for the conference, and also data-driven machine learning based. Uh, um, uh, work. Uh, the last one is something that we just extended. There is a deadline. Uh, we have a running uh, uh, special issue or collection. It's actually uh, uh, called at, uh, the Eurasip Journal on Audio, Speech and Music Processing on Data-Driven Machine Learning Based Room Acoustic Estimation and Modeling. If anybody has some in-flight, work in-flight currently along these lines, that would be good. Of course, if it's not, it's a little ambitious because it's uh, in uh, the uh, the deadline is going to be the end of January 2024. If for any of these reasons you'd like to get in touch with me, please do. Okay. That's it.